Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Tony Gramani joins us from the road in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Tony was one of my f- favorite columnists during my days as editor at Residential Systems Magazine. He wrote broadly about the home theater category, which was apt given his career at Dolby, Lucasfilm THX, the and as the owner of a theater design firm called PMI, as well as an acoustic materials brand called MSR Acoustics. As if those weren't enough irons in one fire, six years ago, he co-founded his own high-performance home theater loudspeaker brand, appropriately called Grimani Systems. I've been meaning to have Tony on the podcast for a while, but I always knew it was going to be one of those conversations that could go on for a while because there's just so much to cover. Tony, thanks for joining me today. Great to see you again. Jeremy, great to see you. Like I, I, I love calling you, hey, boss, how are you? It's, it's, <laughs> That's right. uh, I, I know we're going to have a good time, and I really appreciate the opportunity to get together and chat about this stuff. Yeah, you can, you kind of jumped on uh, the the comment that you're on the road. I uh, I didn't want anybody to think that you actually lived in uh, Argentina. You're you're typically in Nevada, California, um, but uh, you have a reason for being in Argentina. Is that uh, the uh, the in laws place that you, you're you're going to? Is that what I read? Right, right. Um, I don't actually live here in Argentina. My my wife is from Argentina. Uh, we met at the airport, I like to joke, and I'll explain that later. Um, I fell madly in love, got married, have a have a kid, a little cute three and a half mm-hmm. year old who will probably pop right in through that door, right in the middle of our conversation. He'll say like, <laughs> what are you doing in my room or something? Um, right. We're down here visiting the in-laws uh, now that the pandemic, actually we thought uh, had eased up. It's a, a little challenging down here too right now. Um, yeah. But yeah. I'm on the road internationally a fair amount, uh, and it's fun. Well, that, that's that's exciting that we're able to talk from so far away. You said that was definitely not a, an easy uh, trek to get there. It's a pretty pretty long distance even from California. There, um, I, I, I want to jump in though uh, and, and kind of cover the the early life of of Tony Gramani. I have known you in the Cedia channel my whole time doing this. Um, I knew about your background and some of the stops along the way, but we haven't really gotten into a lot of talk about it or details about it. But I I don't really know anything about your upbringing and how you got into the audio. Um, I I, I definitely want to get to the THX story because I think everybody just wants to hear all about the the ranch and all of that. But uh, how did your life in home theater um, and audio kind of start as a young person? Did, where, where, first of all, where did you grow up? Uh, so, yeah, that's a, I'm glad we have a little time. And it's actually really cool to be able to just talk about that rather than tweeters, woofers, absorbers, diffusers, <laughs> and integration. Um, yeah. So, It always sounds weird when I actually say this, and and uh, and what I'm about to say. One time, I got I got hauled off for secondary and uh, verification at an airport uh, coming back from Canada because the person at, at customs was like, "No, that's that's not possible." So here's how it goes: I was actually born in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Okay. From from uh, Australian parents, ah. um, but immigrant for kind of first generation Australians. My dad was actually born in Greece originally. My mom was born in Germany. They met in Australia. Um, and they they met at the radio and TV station where my mom was a DJ and my dad was the chief engineer. Okay. Uh, my, my mom was a professional opera singer who had a radio show and then a TV show in uh, radio and TV Australia on what's called ABC over there, which is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. And my dad was one of the engineers there and they met there and uh, both came from an international background and hung out at the international club and fell madly in love and got married and um, and then my dad took a job with UNESCO, with the United Nations Educational Science and Culture Organization, and uh, in one of his sabbaticals, uh, took a project in Kuala Lumpur to, to help uh, uh, build a technical university over there. And that happened to be where I was born uh, while they okay. were working on building this technical school. Um, and uh, so lived there for a little while, uh, then uh, moved to Australia for a really short time. And then my dad took another project with UNESCO, um, actually this time in Venezuela. 
hmm. not in Caracas, but in a little, a little town called Barquisimeto, to do the same thing as he was doing in Malaysia, which is to put together a uh, a university. And his job was to was to organize the engineering uh, the engineering labs, uh, put together the curriculum, get the teachers, you know, just get the whole thing up and running. So a lot of people don't completely understand what UNESCO does, and I'm not sure that I understand all the things it does. But it's a it's yeah. an international agency that governments in mainly in developing countries can contract to do things, which is either to build a museum, build a university, fix up uh, monuments like they they did gloriously in Egypt um, oh, yeah. about forty years ago, um, etc. So. Um, after Venezuela, there was a few little stops along the way. After Venezuela, we lived in Miami for a little while where my dad worked for an early uh, biomedical company called Cordis. Um, and he always regrets not staying there because right after that, UNESCO asked if he wanted to join the, the mothership, the headquarters office, which was in Paris. Mm. And, uh, the story goes like this. My dad calls my mom and says, I just, just got offered a job in Paris. Do you want to go? Yes. My mom's dream always was to get back to Europe, opera singer and to music. And it's like, Paris, oh, let's go. So off we went to Paris. So I, uh, I, I landed in Paris with my parents when I was six years old um, right. and did all my primary school, you know, my elementary school, uh, junior high, high school, all, all the way through what's called there a baccalaureate, which is the the um, diploma you get at the end of, uh, of your high school process uh, over there. And, and actually ma- mainly in French schools, but in international sections of French schools, which is kind of interesting. So I kind of grew up around people from Lebanon and Japan and Korea and Argentina. Actually, I remember there was an Argentine woman in my class. Um and that was fun. It was fun. So, um, so you primarily speaking French during school then? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So wow. my my you know my mother tongue, I guess was English because uh, that's you know <laughs> what was spoken part time around the house. But really, French was what I mainly grew up with, um, and still generally speak French. It's a little rusty, um, but uh, in in France. Um, I got really interested in electronics. So my dad's an electrical engineer, right? We're yeah. living in a, this tiny little apartment, which by the way, by Parisian standards was huge by US standards. You know, it was un- under a thousand square feet for, you know, full family with grandma. Um, <laughs> and my small bedroom, uh, just about as big as this bedroom here in Argentina, was also my dad's laboratory. So he had a tech bench, all, you know, oscilloscope, generators, all this other stuff. And um the dirty little secret is at night I would get up and like turn on all the gear and play with the oscilloscope and you know it goes like I don't know what all this is but it sure is fun so I did that proverbial thing that you often hear is that as at a young age I'm dismantling things looking at them like what is all this and mm-hmm. you know putting it all back together sometimes my dad would get totally <laughs> crazy furious at me it's like no you're not supposed to touch it it's like I know <laughs> um and uh, still have all that gear, by the way. It's all it's all in my warehouse. All his wow. old scope and uh, all all of that stuff. Um, and so I got interested in electronics. I, I joined a little electronics club. You know, they had one of those hobby electronics clubs, and and also got into music. You know, my parents put me in music classes, and I studied at the conservatory in Paris. Uh, I, I studied mainly clarinet, which is okay. a really difficult instrument for a kid to learn. You don't you don't do much with a clarinet. You just, you know, play the concertos and things they give you and not a very expressive instrument. Um, mm. So study clarinet at the Paris Conservatoire, the Conservatoire de Paris. Um, but so, so I, it's funny because I, I had my, my electronics and technical chops from my dad, you know, sort mm-hmm. of infused there and sort of in the blood and the music chops from my mom. You know, she was always practicing her vocal skills and the, living room la, 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 you know, we're growing up and <laughs> we would go to concerts she would perform in in uh, the beautiful old churches and cathedrals around paris that's a common place to go actually and perform when you're a musician every when there's not a pandemic you know every weekend you can look at the book of things going on and there's probably about 50 different or 60 different concerts you can go to at churches and the acoustics are live and beautiful sure. and um my mom would often be singing and my dad would schlep along the tape recorder and record her singing and we would go mm. and cheer her on. So that's kind of the, the growing up years. Um, and, you know, playing, 
playing with audio with my dad, you know? So yeah, we built speakers. I, I had my own speaker in my bedroom. Then I uh, started building some of my own stuff at about age 13 or 14. I built uh, guitar amps for some friends that had a band in exchange for a motorcycle. So the trade was like, here's a guitar amp. I got a motorcycle. My dad hated that. He was like, no, <laughs> motorcycles are dangerous. And motorcycles are dangerous, but yeah. uh, you know, knock That's on wood. Cool. I've survived that process. <laughs> yeah. um, still ride. Um, oh, okay. And, um, you know, just o- always plays with this stuff. And I, I always thought of it as a hobby. You know, we'd put a new a car stereo in the car when we get a new car and I did enjoy it. Uh, sometimes people go ask me like, when's the first time you really got the, and I, I don't know. I must've been eight or nine. And, and I remember distinctly the Volvo my dad just got and, you know, ripped out the, the radio and we put in a blau punked radio, like the, you know, the best thing you could get at that time. And a pair of uh-huh. these little blau punked ball speakers on the back deck and something in the door. And, um, Flipped it all on. Yeah, I remember crawling around, running the wires and all that stuff. And we flipped it all on. And I, it, it's, you know, some of these things get ingrained in your brain, like these experiences. And I remember when we turned on the radio and he flipped it to stereo FM, because that was just when FM stereo was starting okay. um, over there. And I remember hearing the sound going from, yeah, well, it's on in the car to like that bloom of mm. when you flip on stereo and suddenly the air, you know, just like they say, like, all the, the entire instrumentation went well like that. And yeah, I, I think that's when the vaccine hit or the, uh, the infection happened. It was like, <laughs> wow. Well, I have to say that this is more than I could have asked for, for a build up to where someone got interested in this field, because, uh, I had a note in my, my notes, my outline, Interest in tech, music, science, question mark, question mark, question mark. And you kind of hit it all right there. Um, now, you eventually ended up in college at, um, at one of the California universities, yeah. correct? So yeah, at, that, how, did, how did you make the leap from Paris <laughs> to Cal- California for college? What's up? What's up with that? So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I did my, my schooling in, in the French system. It's a... Um, I think it's changed now, but at the time I, I went through there, it was a pretty archaic system. It was one of those very traditional, like the English and German and other uh, school systems where it's like, you are nothing. You are just a little nothing. Sit down, listen, and, you know, start the schools there start at eight in the morning, end up five. So mm. here's a 12 year old or a 10 year old that's asked to sit down and listen through these classes and write notes all that time. And it was, it was tough. I was actually not a very good student. And um, I'll officially say, for those of you who know me that are watching this and know how much of a workaholic and a, uh, you know, what a, a, you know, people sometimes joke that I'm just, too, I'm just too precision oriented. I'm like too, like, just like relax a little bit. It's like, well, mm-hmm. you know, in school, I was not a very good student. I was like one of one of those guys that's like, well, you know, I'm interested. And then I remember my report cards always going, he's really smart, but but he could do so much better if he only paid attention. And it's like, I'm trying to pay attention <laughs> as much as I can. And it's like, uh. and then I had the occasional good teachers. And I think it does come down for all of you guys who are teachers and who are good at it and who love doing it and who have a passion for it, you know, keep on doing it. You know, I know the pay is not great, but you can make such a difference to students. And I, I remember my physics teacher was one of those. My math Mm. teachers were not. They were like repeating their (laughs) same notes of what they taught for 40 years. But I I was fortunate to have a physics teacher that just loved the stuff and kind of got me um, caught me going with the the elements of technology that relate to physics. So I finished my schooling there passed my baccalaureate. And and then I was like, well, so what am I going to do next? And a a friend of my parents. who they work, who worked with them at UNESCO suggested, you know, we, you should look at getting him into an American university with a, a, a degree from a U.S. university. You can usually go to most parts of the world, um, you know, be it Australia, if I wanted to go back there go to Malaysia, go to wherever. And, you know, if you come, if you come from a well-known U.S. university, you'll, it opens doors. People will go, yeah, okay. I've heard of university of California. It's cool. Um, so originally, it was decided I was going to study medicine. Oh. So 
I applied to a bunch of colleges. Um, ultimately, I, I chose to go to UC Davis uh, on a pre-med uh, program mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, still loved engineering. But I always thought of, of audio engineering and stuff like that as a hobby. It's like, you know, it's a sure. thing you play with. I, I, I don't know why. It wasn't in my mind that I would ever work in this career. So off I went. Um, and studied, st started pre-med and, um, I, I, I didn't do so well in the biological sciences part of it. Uh, when, when I hit, uh, uh, what, what I called biochem misery, biochemistry, it got <laughs> really hard. And a lot of it is about remembering a lot of facts and, um, a lot of equations, a lot of formulas, and it just, it wasn't quite for me. But at the same time, I was taking engineering courses because somewhere in the back of my mind, I was thinking of doing biomedical engineering. My dad had done some of that. He loved it. And I was like, yeah, that sounds really interesting to get in the field of designing machinery and technology for medical applications. So mm -hmm. I'm taking medical classes that are uh, medical. I'm taking medical or pre-med classes that I'm not doing so well in. And then I'm taking engineering, electrical engineering classes that I'm doing great in. I'm absolutely mm. loving it. And so somewhere along the way, I just changed my major from from uh, pre-med to electrical engineering because that was easier for me. Um, okay. I don't know. Electrical engineering is easy, whatever. Um, so I, I ended up specializing in electrical engineering, specializing in analog circuit design and broadcast and things that gradually all went to what audio and video equipment is for broadcast and design of amplifiers, design of, of things that relate to audio. And um, okay. so did that. Um, big shout out along the way. Um, there was a college station at UC Davis uh, uh, called KDVS. It was, as college stations go, it was well-funded. had a 5,000 watt transmitter that carried most of the Sacramento Valley. Um, you know, usually college stations have really small transmitters. They can barely hit the edge of the town. This thing carried all the way as far as, you know, big flat valley, big, big antenna on the top of a tall building carried really far. And I joined the radio station originally as a DJ. And on my first night, uh, the, the main monitor pot, the pot, the actual level control for the monitors in the room fell out of the board. And so I'm like fixing it to make <laughs> the evening show work. And I eventually uh, volunteered to be uh, an assistant engineer and eventually became the chief engineer of this radio station. Got my, my FCC license to do that. And that was as, as a student? You, as a you student. Got that? Um, okay. And big shout out to that, 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 that uh, station because um, the regents of the University of California never really wanted to support it. It sort of seemed like, why, why, you know, why are we paying for this? It's like, well, because mm -hmm. a lot of actually, as it turns out, a lot of very famous entertainers uh, reporters, politicians all went through that station. And, you know, it, it was a breeding ground for a lot of useful training. And mm -hmm. that I got my first sort of professional audio engineering job at that radio station. I, um, towards Very the cool. end of my college career, it was badly in need of a rebuild. The studios were old and fallen apart. The wiring was just not right. And I put in a bid to the regions to actually rebuild all the studios and did that. So tore the whole thing down, oh. rebuilt the, the two main control rooms, put all new equipment, new board, new turntables, new everything is turntables at the time. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, new, new tape decks actually got a really nice Studer machine that probably runs still runs perfectly all these years later. Um, <laughs> and you know, that, that was sort of my, uh, it, you know, aside. F oh, I'm, I forgot to mention another thing I did in college, but uh, that was like a, a big, a really important element that I would encourage anybody who is studying engineering or whatever, you know, there are resources around you that can get you started uh, kind of uh, so that you have something on your resume. And right. when I went to apply for a job at Dolby right out of college, you know, that was one of the things on there. It's like chief engineer at the station. I showed some, some uh, pictures of the, the projects and stuff. It's like, wow, you've done that. It's like, uh, yeah. And yeah, that that's a pretty cool. big college job right there. Yeah, that, that's that's not an internship. That's like a full on, yeah. you know, first job yeah. um, and you're still a student. So, um, well, what was so the other I, thing that you said in college kind of was so a milestone or a big in, point for you? In college, of course, I did school, but I also did music. Uh, mm. So I got to UC Davis and uh, the the guy on in the dorm, the guy on one side of me played electric guitar and I remember it's like I'm a freshman and, you know, I, I learned a little bit of classical guitar when I was uh, also at the conservatory. 
And this kid next door at age, you know, 17, 18 played rock guitar like a god. Even like he did leads mm. and all this shit. It's like, oh my God, I got to learn how to do that. So I went and took the, you know, learn how to play rock guitar course taught at the <laughs> university. And, you know, within a few weeks, I was playing some chords and then started to practice and practice and practice. And I would practice quite a bit. Um, got pretty good at electric guitar and then joined a band. And then I started to join other bands and started to play and did played a lot of music as much as there is time when you're in college because you still have to study. Yeah. Um, and then the, the guy on the other side had a saxophone that was his father's originally uh, that he that, you know, he would play once in a while. It's like, well, that's kind of like playing the clarinet, but it sounds a lot better. So he loaned me his saxophone, um, which I eventually bought and I still own. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started to pick up the guitar from from. <laughs> One one kid in the dorm and saxophone from the other one. So I, I ended up playing both instruments through through college and ended up um, playing playing a lot. Um, and somewhere along the way, I picked up a gig playing with this band called the Violent Femmes. Uh, which no way, so, yes way. <laughs> so they came to town. Um, they 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 were booked in a little nightclub locally, which actually ended up shutting down just a few weeks before uh, their gig. And I lived at that point, I lived off off campus in a in a house shared with a bunch of people. And we had this huge living room, like the, the owner of this house had expanded into this club sized living room. And we got called by the the guy who was running the the, the promotion of their concert said, um, I know you have parties in your house once in a while. The violent femmes are coming in town. Would you mind if you know the venue is closed? Do you mind if we have them play in your living room? It's like violent femmes playing in my living room. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so they come and play in the living room, and along the way they go, "Hey, do you know anybody who plays, uh, you know, horns? They like to pick up horn players on their gigs and just play a few songs, just you know, loosey goosey." It's like, "Well, I'll play the saxophone. Great, you're hired." So. In my living room in front of, you know, the, the people at UC Davis that liked alternative music, I played a few songs just kind of really quickly. They told me what key it was in. They, they said, they asked me, so you play okay? Yeah. Um, do you know how to play primal? Okay, primal. I think I know what you mean. You know, that was it. That was like the instruction. Play primal. Uh, okay, key of G, go. And so I just played along on this song called Black Girls and... And then when it was time, they pointed, pointed at me. I just, I did one of these solos that was very avant-garde, sounded like a screaming electric guitar lead with all kinds of and like screaming <laughs> and the, the reed and everything. And like, okay, would you like to go on tour with us? Wow. So the, uh, the thinking process was about a quarter second. It was like, yeah. <laughs> so uh -huh. I went, I went and toured with them for a little while. Uh, you know, it was getting close to finals week. And I said, whatever, man. So I, I ran around <laughs> with them for a while. And what was fun is I ran around with them for a while, long enough to go, you know, I don't really want to do this when I'm 40. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is a lot of fun, but I can tell that this could get old. Um, yeah. So wait, now, was this toward finals of your, like the middle of college or late? Se senior year. See, oh my gosh. So, so you were trying to wrap up, but you're just like, eh, that can, that can wait. I can come back. That can wait. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it, and it's funny because I think a, a, a lot, a lot of the work I've done has been a little bit like that, where like an opportunity shows up where you go, I can't pass this up. This is, this is amazing. I got to do this. So, you so, know, so did you just, uh, were you US tour? Um, kind it, of gigs or what it, was it? it? It was only West Coast at the time. Um, oh, okay. You know, all crammed into the van and drove up and down and, I, mean, yeah, I, I don't really well. know their history so much, but I did see them later on. I was kind of checking. I had to look at your uh, graduation date, which is 84, correct? Yeah. Um, uh, I, it ended up, it, it was supposed to be 84. I ended, ended up graduating and it, you know, it took okay. 85 because I went to my professor and was like, I, sorry, I'm not going to be able to do finals. Uh, what can we do? And most of them were very gracious about it. It's like, okay, we'll hold off on this. Some of them said like, you're going to have to take the class again. But other ones were like, you know, we'll put it on hold. You you can do a catch up final later. We'll we'll do um, orals. You know what whatever. So yeah, yeah. Well, I saw I saw that band in uh, at the Forty Watt Club in Athens, Georgia, where I went to school in '92. So it was a bit later on, but yeah. still great. I love that. That was one of the yeah. 
Great cool band. They still perform. Seen. I played with them last year uh, oh. at a at a club in Berk in Berkeley, California. Um, they're still great. It's amazing, actually. So you know, I was like, you know, this is going to be ugly when we're forty. Well, those guys are now probably fifty or late fifties. Yeah, um, for sure. And and are still putting on an amazing show. So testament to like how good you can actually sustain the thing. The energy's still there. They haven't gotten like. Mm. Um, so anyway. <laughs> Um, so did well, that so for, what, it was a lot of fun. I got to say. So you, you, you get a little bit delayed in your graduation, but it was your first job out of college Dolby then? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what did you do at Dolby? So I joined actually this story of how, uh, I could go on forever with this, but I'll just mention this really, really, uh, so I'm, I'm back, I'm back in college. I finally graduate. I finished the radio station. I'm like, okay. And, you know, the band's trying to figure out at that point, this band I played in uh, called Vox Humana, we're on our second album, we're getting some pretty good gigs. And we're like, you know, what do we keep doing this? And I'm looking for jobs. And I, all that I'm seeing out there is jobs for military contractor. I applied for a job at Johnson and Johnson on a line that would make feminine hygiene products. And I was like, oh, whatever, you know, it's an engineering job, we'll be fine. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm actually looking through the newspaper because the van we used for the band transport blew up like, and I was tired of fixing that engine. I I also do. I did. uh, No, actually, I still, I still work on my old, I have an old 1937 car. I have some old machines. I I used to do a lot of of mechanic stuff. My hands were always dirty, just fixing cars, motorcycles, and bicycles. Um, And so I was the guy who was fixing the van. It finally blew up. I'm like, we're going to buy something a little newer. I'm flipping flipping through the newspaper, looking for, you know, something, a Ford van, Dodge van, something. And like, I flipped through the paper and like, there's an ad for Dolby. I was like, whoa, Dolby's hiring. You know, it's like, I never thought that I, I could get a job in the audio business. I, it's like I'm having, hadn't even crossed my mind. I always thought I'd be just be working for an or, you know, ordinary corporation. Um, so I applied for the job, got, a, got uh, asked to an interview. Uh, the interview was the day after our most important gig. <laughs> we huh. got a gig at a, at a club in San Francisco. It was called the Keystone. And the band was like, you are doing this gig. I don't care that you have an interview the next day. You're doing this gig. <laughs> Okay, um, so played at the Keystone. It turns out Dolby was two blocks away or a block and a half away from the Keystone. It was on on Broadway. Um, you know, so stayed up late enough to late enough to finish the gig and be you know bright eyed and bushy tailed at the interview the next day. And you know, aced the interview. All the technical questions they asked me, you know, I could answer. It all made sense. Like, well, yeah, this is what I do for a hobby and have studied electrical engineering and all the stuff and. And then the guy who's interviewing me goes, well, so do you, um, you know, do you play any music? It's like, well, play some guitar and some saxophone. It's like, oh, cool. Do you, do you, do you play in a band? And it's like, eh, I play in a band. Well, what's the name of the band? Oh, it's Vox Humana. He looks at me and it's like, you were playing on Broadway yesterday, last night nice. at the Keystone. I saw it on, on the marquee. And I'm like, oh, I'm so busted. I'm like, I, they're not going to give me this job. They don't want to, you know, rock and roll or, you know, hanging out. And, and I was wrong. They were like, that was it. I found out later that was really important to them that I was active in music and yeah. that I could stay up late enough to finish a gig and the next morning be semi coherent. <laughs> and that, that was well, Tony. Fun. So, so just for a quick uh, interlude here, what was the um, what was Dolby in your mind when you saw that ad? What, what were you thinking Dolby was associated with? Was it something you saw in movie credits or right. uh, was it? Uh, some kind of a button on a car stereo. What what was Dolby yeah. at that time? Um, well, so Dolby at that time was already very firmly implanted in movie theaters, uh, right? So the the ob- obvious big hit with Star Wars, but you know everything you saw that was big in in the theaters was Dolby stereo, uh, mm-hmm. which didn't mean two channel; it meant surround sound. That's the, the mm-hmm. term in, in movie sound of stereophonic sound is is actually immersive surround sound. Um, and I was also familiar with the noise reduction technology used on both professional and consumer technology. And the, the job was actually in the in the, the licensing department, which was working on engineering of um, licensable technologies. I didn't know much more than that because the, the ad wasn't clear. Mm-hmm. Um, but what they were looking for and they hired me for was, was somebody who would take care of the microchip 
uh, development. So uh, microchips for mainly Dolby B and C type noise reduction. There's this technology called HX Pro, and that was a, about it. There was other little uh, side side technologies, but that was the main thing. So they hired me as a as a chip designer to work with the manufacturers that that made microchips under license to be put into cassette decks largely. Mm. Okay. And was that something with your college degree with uh, engineering that yeah. you're doing chip design stuff already? Yep. Th that was, um, you know, it, w when I chose to specialize in analog circuit design, I mean, I also did digital stuff, but, you know, the, the analog mm. stuff is really what, pa what, what was my passion is like she knowing how to design audio stages and analog circuitry. That's what I was like, you know how to do that? And you know, they, they gave me some circuit diagrams and said, well, can you analyze this? Like, oh well, yeah, this does this and that and this and that. And then they were like, what's wrong with this train? It's like, well, that's not gonna work. The game structure, that's gonna over, and it was like, okay, so you know this and that, that's what I did. It was actually nice. helped design microchips for analog chips. Don't ask me to do that anymore. I don't remember <laughs> it, it was years ago. Okay. Um, so what was interesting, uh, maybe you're going there, I don't know, uh, is, I, I, in addition to all these passions I had or that I mentioned is I, I was, I was also really interested in at the time, what I would call quadraphonic sound or surround sound, um, from hearing that at a friend's house, one of, one of my friend's dads brought back a receiver. I think it was probably a Sansui with quadraphonic sound in it and put up some extra speakers and man, we would just play with that stuff and listen to all the 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 QS and SQ recordings he would have and it was like wow that's really cool so I had yeah. you know an interest in that and I'm I'm just joined Dolby I'm there to design beat you know B type and C type noise reduction chips primarily but there's some noise going on in the background about bringing surround the the Dolby stereo experience into the home mm -hmm. and there's a lot of poo poo uh, so there's a there's a contingent of Really, there's actually my predecessor, uh, Steve Solari. I remember him if you're st still listening. Hello, um, <laughs> was was also interested in that, and um, I was like, I'm kind of hearing this, as in, it's like, and it's like, what's this about the surround program? It's like that'll never work. People don't want more speakers at home. The quadraphonic era came and went. Forget about it, young man. Go back and design, you know, noise reduction chips. It's like, I don't know. It seems kind of fun, um, you know, home videos around. It seems kind of like cool and. And I got more and more interested in it and kind of formed this little skunk works coalition uh, of a few people that, you know, despite the fact that the, that the top brass was saying there's no future in promoting surround sound for home applications, we're like, no, we think there was something. And uh, Roger Dressler was one guy you hear once in a while you hear of, Dennis Statz, who's doing something different now in the industry. Uh, Steve Solari and I we were like, we think we should do this. And so we pushed and pushed and pushed and actually um, eventually convinced management, Ray Dolby, president of the company also, and you know the top brass, it's like we should push this program. And the rest is history. It's everywhere now. And how, how involved were you with that after it was uh, finally accepted as a plan? Very. Uh, so, you know, we had to develop circuitry uh, that was applicable for home applications and then mm -hmm. uh, develop communication programs for the licensing to go show it to all of the manufacturers under license, get it, get it accepted, get it built it, build it and then promote it out into the market. And it was uh, very, very involved in it. And uh, yeah. it was my involvement in that that kind of caught, I guess, caught the attention of Tom Holman and other people at Lucasfilm. Yeah. Um, who about five years later decided they were going to start to take what had been built at Dolby in, in the nascent home theater program and uh, put the layer of THX technologies on top of that. And they were looking for somebody and asked me if I wanted to join there. Yeah. So what was their secret sauce? I know THX in the theater realm as well, the, the commercial theater realm. Um, so what were they looking to do to enhance what Dolby was working on, what right. you would come up with at Dolby then, and when when you joined them, what were what was that plan like? Right, uh, a good plan. Otherwise, I wouldn't have joined. Um, so yeah. the, the way I like to describe it is is Dolby has always been an expert at super efficient packaging of audio or video. Um, actually, mm -hmm. Ray, Ray Dolby started as an engineer at Ampex working on video machines, uh, figuring out how to do noise reduction so that the dynamic range of the video could be better. 
and kind of took some of that learning in, into forming the, the Dolby uh, Corporation. And so they always found a way to take music with a dynamic range this big, squeeze it down into a medium that's only this big, and then and then expand it back out uh, so that it's rest, it's restituted as it originally was. And that was the concept of the noise reduction is to essentially, quote unquote, compress the dynamic range onto the tape and then expand it back out. And by the expansion, you push the noise down. Hmm. Um, and in, in Dolby Stereo, Dolby Surround, they found a way to take to get take four channels of sound and squeeze them down into the two available channels. And then upon playback, expand them back out into four. Okay. These days, they're in the business of taking 32 channels of sound, squeezing it down into a track that can only take six channels of sound and then open it back up into something that's 32 channels. So the, hmm. it, it it's sort of their core expertise, and they're amazing at that. The, the amount okay. of brain power that's there is is ludicrous about how, what, how, what they know in terms of how to do that. And it, it sort of is, it's as, it's as intense essentially as the teleporting process in Star Trek, where you take the person and then you vaporize them and then you expand <laughs> them back out into a person. It's, it's almost that great in terms of audio video. Okay. Um, past that, it's like, well, here's our 32 channels of sound. And now what do you do with that? And yeah. that's where, that's where THX takes over. THX says, okay, well, this is the way it was heard in the production studio, in the, in the actual uh, film studio environment. Here's the standards for how the speakers are decided and set up and tuned and put in place, how the acoustics are built. And we're going to transport that knowledge into the movie theater originally. So we're going to build movie theaters or help build movie theaters that sound and look just like the the studio environment and then later home theaters that have the same audio and video quality as what you would what you would see in a studio mm -hmm. um so that's really the, the shtick at thx is you know how to once the channels have been found back you know how do we how do we present this so that the oral experience and visual experience is exactly as the director intended that's the the propaganda it's a good propaganda it's really what they do Right, right. So that's kind of the certification of a theater and all, all of that, the, that standard that you create and right. all the all the elements and technology. So the certification. Support it. So sometimes people say, well, the the way you get a certification is you pay money. It's like payola. That's a complete lie. Uh, that's a poo poo conserv a conservative reactionary approach at it. No, before a theater can be certified, the certification just says that the theater has designed the room correctly, has built mm -hmm. it correctly, has installed all the gear correctly, and has calibrated it correctly. Um, they've done all of their work, just like getting a diploma. You've you've gone through all of your courses and you get your diploma. It means you meet the standards and every year it gets retested and readjusted and recertified. And same thing with home THX equipment. The product mm -hmm. has been designed and built per the standards. Um, in the case of home THX, there's also some licensed some patented technologies that go in it to make the sound of a small room, you know, a room that may be 22 feet long, appear like it's the same sound as a room that may be 150 feet, like a movie theater. Um, and uh, the the home THX gear has a combination of design and quality standards together with patented technologies that get put in there to, to make that simulation work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, well, um, I, I do want to continue. I want to get a, a little bit more into detail about your time at THX um, and then how you transition into your current career. Um, but first, we're going to just take a short break. Did you know that 34% of broadband households are concerned about the air quality inside of their homes? Parks Associates' new quantified consumer study, Fresh Air, Air Quality and Comfort in the Smart Home addresses consumer concern regarding indoor air quality as well as interest in air quality products and services. Our research of 10,000 broadband households finds that about 20% of broadband households are likely to purchase a smart climate or indoor air quality device in the next six months. This new consumer analysis quantifies concerns, perception of product value, and purchase intentions. For more information on fresh air, air quality, and comfort in the smart home, contact sales at parksassociates.com. Welcome back. I'm talking with Tony Grimani. Tony, um, as as you kind of went along in your career at THX, um, I, I know that you said you worked with uh, Tom Holman, who is a legend in surround sound. 
Um, were you also crossing paths with George Lucas while you were there? Yeah, I was. Uh, let's pause real quick. Jeremy, your camera looks like it's a little out of focus. It was beautiful for a long time, and suddenly it looks like it may be trying to focus on something different. Yeah, I think we're okay on the stream. Um, Alan, I think I uh, can confirm on that. It, it, well? it Okay. Okay. All yeah, right, so we, just, we, yeah. we can, we can clean that up. No problem. Now, now back to our program. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry. So uh, why don't you ask that again? Yeah. So um, when you were at THX, you cl clearly, you mentioned working with Tom Holman, who's a legend in surround sound and uh, one of the pioneers there at THX. And were you also crossing paths with George Lucas at the time? Yeah. Uh, so there were occasional uh, meetings and discussions with uh, George, George, as we called him. Um, <laughs> he, uh, George is, George is a, a storyteller. He's an artist and didn't want to get too involved in the issues of cameras, microphones, loudspeakers. So it was like, <laughs> yep, you know, just make sure it sounds good. Yep. It's all, it's yeah. all great. Do your thing. Um, and, uh, you know, really appreciated the work THX did to ensure that the art, you know, the extensive amount of picture production and sound production that Lucasfilm always did, now a lot of other people do that too, could be conveyed. Because there's, there's no point in putting a lot of effort into really good cinematography, really good visual effects, really good audio recording and audio post-production if the playback environment is poor. You know, you're right. just basically wasting your time. So he he appreciated that we were there essentially to act as curators for the art form. Okay. Well, um, I, we could probably talk THX for forever, but I, I, I really want to kind of go into what you do today and what you've been doing mm -hmm. for a while. Um, what was the decision to go out on your own and I guess become a theater designer, a home theater yeah. designer? Um, would that be how... Would, is that how you would kind of explain what you did there in that uh, career I'm, move? I'm, I would. Um, I'm often referred to when, when I'm working with architects and builders as as the home theater consultant or the the designer. Um, yeah, is an interesting decision. So I was at THX for almost ten years, um, and you know, I was happy. It was all good. Uh, there was no no problems. But I I kept noticing that expensive home cinemas private screening rooms, whatever you want to call them, home theaters, I call them home cinemas, were often designed without, even though we did our training, I was always like, man, that you know, I I, I wish there was uh, somebody out there as a consultant that could help these guys do a better job. And I would steer, you know, I, I would be in touch with dealers and I would steer them to this acoustical company or that acoustical company. Um, but I, I noticed that a, a lot of projects got done with good equipment but not very good acoustical or optical design for the rooms. Why? Because it's complicated. Why? Mm. Because the architect didn't want to, because the interior designer had, you know, a say in it. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, somebody should start a company that, that really specializes in, in doing this. And, um, you know, a little shout out to my buddy, uh, Russ Herschelman on this, because mm -hmm. he, I think he's the one that kind of pushed me over the edge. It's like, well, you should do that. Like, no, I'm, I work here. Well, it's like, you should just start a company that, helps design home theaters. Um, and I, it's like, now, now, now what was Russ? Russ was a dealer, right? Um, early right. Cedia integrator. Right. Um, right. how did he know you? How are you guys um, crossing paths? Um, so, uh, Russ was in our area. He's sort of a, a, a friend of THX. I met him very, very early on, like a lot of dealers, you know, just that came to the ranch for the training and we oh, okay, stayed good sure. buddies from that, but his, his office, was just essentially right down the road from Skywalker Ranch where I worked and we got together regularly to just chat about the industry. We enjoyed each other's company. And mm -hmm. he is the he is the one who who caused this. It's his fault. <laughs> and who's like, yeah, you know, you should start a company. So it, it took me about a year for this to cogitate and and just get into it. And it's like, okay, you know what? What the hell? Just kind of like jumping in the van and going touring with the the violin femmes. It was like, you know what? Sure. I'm gonna yeah. start that. So uh, it actually took me another year to leave THX because uh, you know it was a lot of work to do. I loved my boss, uh, Monica Dashwood. We 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 got along really well. Did great work. So I kind of wound down for a year and and then started 
a company that specializes in designing home cinemas and now recording studios and a bunch of other things related to the engineering of acoustics and optics in, in media spaces. So I, I decided not to call it home theater design specialists or something like that. It's called Performance Media Industries, PMI, mm-hmm. because it's it's all about offering a system or offering a service to design media environments for high performance use. Mm-hmm. Makes um, sense. So, yeah, so I started that in 99. Uh, mm-hmm. So we're now into 22 years. We've done a thousand projects. I can't believe it's been that many uh, wow. all over the world. We've done, we've designed c- a complete film post-production facility in Mongolia, in, in Ulaanbaatar, mm. Mongolia. I've been there, um, worked on projects in, in Israel, in Russia, in in France, in England, and, you know, and a few in the USA too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a few. Well, mm-hmm. y- you and I talked a little bit before the recording that, the international uh, experience and the folks that you work with, the uh, integrators in different countries, um, continue to impress you. Um, what what's what do you think? I, I think a lot of people in the U.S. maybe not quite as aware of that international uh, extension of that CEDIA type integrator and how great the quality of the work is. Not yeah. just from Americans going abroad, but international folks who are learning to do this stuff really well. So what, what have you seen out there? Yeah. So so working on projects in Mexico and projects in England, projects in Australia, I've been blown away, actually, not just impressed, but blown away by the with the caliber of the designers and integrators in those countries. There's sort of an assumption that, you know, in the U.S. is where the sophisticated stuff happens and everywhere else it's sort of poo-poo, you know, whatever, low end, and it's not so. Um People in those foreign countries that I'm working with are, are often electrical and mechanical engineers uh, that work for integration firms um, and are often extremely creative and meticulous about what they do. And um, it is very gratifying to see CEDIA expanding as an international operation um, and having people from foreign countries on the board in top committees, like right now I'm, I'm working on two very important committees uh, that are doing important engineering work and standards work. And one of them is run by an Englishman who spent a lot of time doing work in the Middle East, now works for an Italian company. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it's it's just great to have that international input. And there's what's really cool about it is not just to notice that, yeah, people in Australia know how to design a really good theater and build a really good theater. And that's that's cool. But when you go to other places, you see different ways to go about solutions. And there's a great learning from looking at how they build stuff in other countries. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I do encourage people in the U S to, you know, ha- have you know, keep your minds open to what people are doing in other countries. Look at, look at what the integrators are doing. Um, I love it when the winner of a, of a award, for, you know, every year CEA has the awards for best this and best that. And often the winner is somebody from a different country these days. And right. you know, look at those projects. Look at how people in Mexico go about building a theater, given what they have to do in their construction standards. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, I've, I've even experienced that. Uh, I get the uh, honor of being a Lutron uh, excellence judge every year. And uh-huh. it, it's a lot of international um, uh, projects that are just amazing huge homes and really beautiful work. You know, of course that's just one element of an integrated home, but it's, it's a really great one to show your artistry. Mm-hmm. Um, what about, um, wh- when you're doing a project, how much of the, let's say it is a dedicated home theater. How much of that project are you influencing? Um, where does your role kind of stop when the integrator, the, the, like a room interior designer type person take over? Yeah. Um, so, so every project's a little different depending on the culture of the project, but the, the typical project were brought in by the integrator as a resource to help engineer the room and produce a set of plans. So our, our role is usually uh, very early on in the design of a residence or, or a commercial space when things are, are just still at basic architectural plan. And there's an area that said, well, this is where the home cinema, the theater is going to be. And we look at that and we talk with all the stakeholders, you know, how many seats do you want? How loud do you want it? Would you, how big of a screen are you looking at? And then we engineer 
to the room to figure out what kind of speakers they need, where the seats got to be, what the riser heights need to be. How do you design the ventilation system, the electrical system? How do you design the wall structures so that there, there's proper sound isolation from rooms above or rooms below, rooms laterally? And then we design the internal acoustics so that the sound that's leaving the speakers is properly supported by the room and not echoed in an uncontrolled way in the room. And so we'll engineer all that. We've got this 45 page spreadsheet we use to like figure out all the numbers. And we, we put that on a plant set. And usually our plant sets 40 or 50 pages of every detail. So this wall has to be built this way. And every wall structure has maybe two or three pages showing all the different views of how, how you build it. Where do the screws go? Where do the isolators go? How do you put the sealant caulk here and there and all of these different things? Um, and then we, we work with a construction team to make sure it built, gets built correctly. So we, we go on site and verify that they're following the plans correctly, modify the plans if there's any unforeseen uh, changes, and then work with the integrator to put the systems in and then tune them. So uh, very often the projects are between 100 and 200 hours of work, so fair amount of work. Uh, and we're very involved essentially on, as, a, as an engineer resource to make sure the room comes out well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to, to be fair, you, you could, without hiring us, if you're lucky, you could put all the stuff in the right places. And if, if everything falls into place, you could actually win the lottery. Um, and there's a one chance in a million that you'll win the lottery or less. <laughs> um, or you, or you hire somebody like us or some of our colleagues. There's, we're not the only firm that does this now. There's about four or five good companies and, um, a, a, a homeowner, a builder, and certainly an integrator should look at hiring us because there's a, there's a meticulousness about the engineering that's, that's hard to get until you do it enough. And the, ultimately, the idea is, look, we, we kind of want to make sure that you build this only once. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, don't, don't build it. Oh, that didn't work. Tear it down. Rebuild it. Oh, that didn't quite work either. Tear it down. We just want to make sure it's pro- properly thought through, built, and then it, it, it works right. So. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah. So, so how much of the fi- the finish work are you influencing? Um, because that's part of the acoustics. It's not necessarily yeah. the base, you know, the the fun- foundational acoustics. But um, you're not a interior designer, so there's oh, someone yeah. else that's kind of doing those feature- pieces, like the walls and the the seats and all that. So I'd say about 20% of our projects, we do the interior design. So we're hired oh, to you know, take it all the way to the end, including, you know, what does the interior look like? What's the fabric? What's the colors? Uh, 80% okay. of the time, the project has an interior designer already assigned. The, the architecture firm may have an, an interior design division, or in most cases, there's an interior designer hired by the homeowner to hold, to basically tie the whole house together so that the design follows through. It's all beautiful. And so uh, 80% of the time we're working as a resource, as an advisory resource to the interior design to make designer to make sure that what they're putting in place will allow good picture and sound. And mm-hmm. so at that point we're, we're influencing, right. And we're not, mm-hmm. we're not the designers, but we're influencing the designer to make sure they understand why we need fabric here and where, where do you put wood? Where do you put metal? Where do you put lights? Where do you put, um, color, different colors in the room so that everything ends up coming right optically and, and visually. Um, and that's fun. I, so for the record, I actually love working with interior designers. I am actually absolutely blown away that a person could just be thinking of something, just draw it up on a little sketch and then, you know, do a construction development of it, get these little samples of fabric and paint and in their mind's eye kind of go, I think it's going to work out and you build it all and you go, Wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. And you could figure all this out from these like little pieces of paint color. Mm. I mean, it's a skill. So big hats yeah. off. Any interior designers or architects listening, you know, hats off because that is, that's a very special skill. Well, where was the deci- decision to start manufacturing acoustics? Um, mm-hmm. Or is that, is that what that is? MSR is uh, an actual yeah. brand of product, correct? Right. So um, a number of years into uh, PMI engineering, we got frequent requests from builders uh, that you know, would look at our plans and go, you know, so I see all the stuff. I don't know where to get all these absorber diff- diffusers, base absorbers, all the stuff, all these isolators. Can you just, you know, put together a complete bill of goods 
and a proposal for supplying that. And we're like, well, that's not what we do. And we got enough questions it's like, well, maybe we'll start doing that. And mm -hmm. so we, we started vending the materials to people to see how well that worked. And it aided the process because the, what ended up showing up on site is actually what's in the plan. Mm -hmm. And then um, one thing led to another. Uh, we, we actually started to design our own line of absorbers and diffusers to fulfill a need we saw in doing things that other manufacturers didn't do. And then another thing led to another, and I had a long dinner with a guy called Keith Olson, six-time Grammy Award-winning uh, producer and engineer who's got great album credits to his name. He he did a lot of uh, Fleetwood Mac, Pat Benatar, uh, Santana, Grateful Dead, um, White Snake. He got really well known for the L.A. big hair metal mm -hmm. scene sound. <laughs> um, and uh, he he left the recording business to go work for Mackie making making recording equipment, okay. um, speakers and recording equipment. And he kept noticing that a lot of the people they sold stuff to didn't know where to get acoustics. And he was like, you know, I love what you're doing with this, you know, these things. We should start a company and and like, mm. you know, make these products as packages. And he convinced me to start a new company, MSR Acoustics, where we are our, our main I guess our main business model is not only do we sell absorbers and diffusers, but we, we give a recipe kind of like those people now where you can, uh, there's a bunch of different companies, I won't name them, but you can sign on to them and, and they, they will deliver you all of the ingredients for your dinner tonight. So I right, right, yeah. in a little fridge is mm -hmm. all the things you need and a recipe to like cook it all up. And that was sort of the concept is we're going to figure out from your room sizes that you need this package, here's the price, order it, decide whether you want it in red, blue, or green or whatever, and it will yes. show up and install it. And that's mm -hmm. the main kind of the business approach of MSR Acoustics across the years is let's just make this easy for you and, right. and package it. And, and, then, um, and then that brings us up to Gramani Systems, which I, I sat through your, your initial uh, presentation yeah. at Cedia where you talked about finding a client who was really willing to help you um, get this thing off the ground. And um, there, there's so many speaker brands. What, what was it that you felt like was special that you needed to do differently with your speakers? Yeah. So that story has a, has a why to it. Um, why, why we even got into that. Um, I was really pining for speakers made in a certain way for the integration business. Um, a, a lot of speaker companies would just take their regular product and go here, integrate this. And, mm -hmm. you know, integrators made it work. They would take speakers that were main, meant to be in the room and, you know, hide them in this wall and that thing and that thing. And companies like uh, Triad and other ones, you know, started going from being kind of hi-fi companies to integration companies. But I felt like there was a bunch of things that could still be done to make it easier to integrate. And I kept asking for this and asking for that from different speaker companies. It's like, you know, will you make a speaker that does this? And when you make a speaker that does that, and it was like, yeah, that's just not really what we do. Hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Uh, I, I wish you did. Cause then I would just spec, spec that in. And then I know it would work. It would be easier to install. So that was one impetus that, you know, there was, I had, I kind of, I had a dream that speakers <laughs> would be made this way. One, two, I hired as a chief engineer, a guy I'd met many years before by the name of Manny Lacaruba, who was the chief engineer of the plant recording studios in, in uh, the Bay Area, in Sausalito, very famous mm -hmm. recording studio. Oops, just dropped, yeah. speaking of recording studios, just dropped my microphone. I'm back. <laughs> um, and Great album credits for very, very famous bands. Like, you know, just look it up, The Plant. It's amazing how many yeah. really, really famous albums got recorded there. And he retired from that. And he invented this new waveguide technology, which his purpose was to actually have, a, a, interestingly, a lot of what THX always claimed you should do in designing a speaker, which is a really even horizontal dispersion, some amount of focus vertically, but a very constant directivity. Uh, constant directivity, meaning that the sound on axis has the same character as the sound off axis. Maybe it's lower in level off axis, but it's the same frequency response. And he obsessed over that, actually, all the way mm. from his college years. He, he studied um, uh, music and music technology in a, at a 
it's called SUNY Fredonia in, in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And with Dave Moulton started to invent these ways to de design mid and high frequency drivers that had really even dispersion and even uh, sound power or, or constant directivity. It's, those are all same word, different words to describe the same thing. So he had, de he had developed this new waveguide that he ended up licensing to Bang and Olufsen. Um, and was sort of in semi retirement. It's like, hey, you know, Manny, I need a chief engineer to help us do designs. Will you join what we do? So he became our chief engineer for PMI engineering. Okay. Um, and that, but he kept noodling with these waveguides, and he came up with this new version of this really nice waveguide. He was like, wow, it'd be really nice to put this in a home theater. And we built some prototypes and built a, our own little prototype theater. It's like, wow, that sounds really good. And so then I tried to help Manny license that new waveguide to different manufacturers. And people looked at it like, eh, I don't know what to do with that. And mm. so like, eh. so I'm, I've, now I've got two dreams. One is that someday people will use this waveguide to make really good speakers for home theater one. And two, someday people will make active speakers that have this kind of character and this kind of performance and these shapes and this dynamic character. And we, uh, it just sat there going like, yeah, whatever, maybe someday somebody will do this. And uh, the turning point was an, uh, a client of ours liked so much what we did for his listening room that said, hey, you know, I love what you guys are doing. You know, I'd love to, I'd love to do work with you guys. I'd love to invest in what you're doing. And we're like, well, we, we, we have this prototype speaker concept over here. Do you want to hear it? And he, you know, we, we actually cobbled it back together. Uh, he put a little funding money together to build actually a, a system. And we gave him a demo. He was like, oh my God, that sounds so much better than what I've got in my high-end room now. And I'm not going to mention the brand because I just, I don't want to mention yeah. that, but it's a well-known brand of really high quality speakers. He had, it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so he, you know, wrote a few big checks to fund the development of a new company. And we're like, wow, can we even run with this? So we, we studied the market extensively, hired some really, uh, expensive business planners and, and analysts. And they said, yeah, there's a business there. So the business started six years ago was like the, the beginning of that. Uh, I think we, we finally got to market with real product about four years ago. And we now have a, a whole range of loudspeakers from a little bookshelf size speaker about this big, you know, about 13 inches tall by 10 inches wide and six inches deep, all the way to this Mahangas that we call the Alpha that's about five and a half feet tall and will drive a 70 foot long room at ear piercing levels. Wow. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy with what it does. So the, the main concept behind it is by using these, your, your life as an integrator is made easier because it just, mm. it just comes together easier. A lot of things were thought out so that the installation's easier, the calibration's faster, everything just comes together easier. And um, so that's where we are. And, and so I got to tell you, uh, you didn't ask me this, but I, and I know we're like going well into time, but check this right. out, Jeremy. You asked me, what does PMI do? One of the things PMI does in the end is to go on site and spend two to three days calibrating the audio of an, a full Atmos system. It usually takes two or three days. So okay. I travel somewhere with two suitcases full of test equipment that make the airlines go nuts because it all looks really dangerous in there. And they're always <laughs> asking me, what's in this? It's like, it's an analyzer and a multiplexer microphone. Here, let me show you. Like, hey, shut up. Just get out of here. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and that's how it's normally done. I go on site, lots of gear. Well, from this room in Buenos Aires, Argentina, yesterday, I calibrated a theater in Brussels, full Atmos. Uh, so 9.4.4 system. So three front speakers, wide sides, backs, four top speakers, four subwoofers, by remote control in about seven hours with me being here at this particular computer in this room, remote controlling the full system in Brussels, there is a technician on the other side. There's a person there listening, moving the microphone, you know, confirming what I'm seeing and hearing. We're looking at each other on a conference call like this, and I'm, I'm driving by remote control the application that sets up the whole thing. And, and at, in the end, the technician is like, this sounds amazing. Sounds as, sounds as good as our demo room that I did for them you know, in person a few years ago. And, and you can do that. And that's an amazing testament to the success of the vision, which is like, there is a way to make this easier. Mm. There's a way to make this uh, technologically advanced to where we can leverage the power of the internet, the internet of things. Mm -hmm. 
And there's a way for me to be, you know, at my parents-in-law in Buenos Aires, Argentina, calibrating a theater in Brussels. <laughs> Can't do well, that with other systems. Well, I I think we we need to talk again because there's still so much more to even discuss with Gramani Systems and the the projects that you're working on with that. But uh, I think we're going to need to wrap it up because uh, it's it's yeah. been about an hour and I, I really do appreciate your time and I've learned so much about you. Um, Tony, thanks so much for joining me today. I really had a great time talking to you. Jeremy, this was fun for all of those of you who actually sat through an hour of this babble. Thank you so much for your attention. Maybe we can edit some of this out. Uh, but yeah, this is fun. I'd love to do more of it. Uh, there's plenty more to, to chat about and have, have a good time with it. Absolutely. Tony Gramani is owner of PMI, MSR Acoustics, and Gramani Systems. If you want to track down Tony, probably the best place to start would be his PMI website, pmiltd.com. That wraps up today's show. Thanks uh, to everybody for joining us. If you're new to the show, be sure to share, subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts. And check out all the latest residential tech news at restechtoday.com. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell.